you told me by age 26, you had 11 different businesses. Yes. You said around the, in your early or mid 20s, you were producing Broadway shows that you were like in the mix at a very early, early age. How, how did that kind of come to be? And, and what were those 11 businesses? All right, man, we're live. We, uh, we, we always just kind of hop into things, but uh, on the pod today, we have Michael Harris. But do you like to go by Harry O or Michael? What do you like to go by? Well, people call me, you know, people that know me by Harry O, call me Harry, call me O or Michael, whatever works. <laughs> so I'll kind of set this up. But, but basically, I'll tell you, I, I, I've, I've read a lot about you and I've read about a lot of the work that you've done. The way that we got connected was... We have a mutual friend named Chris who um, yes. has this th has this thing called the Last Mile, which helps people when they get out of prison, helps them get jobs at tech companies. And he's been bragging about you because I told him, <laughs> you, you 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 can't see it now because I I redecorated, but on my wall I used to have a picture of Tupac and Dre and Easy E because I loved N.W.A. and I loved right. like the rebellious culture of of people who created cool stuff. And he goes, hey, you know, I know the guy who is part you know part brains behind all that. And I go, what? And he said, who you, you know, he said your name. I go, oh, I've read all about him. And he goes, well, I, I he's my, he's my buddy. And so that's kind of <laughs> yeah. how, that's kind of how we got connected. And so I thought today we can kind of talk a little bit about your story so people can learn about you, but then also we can talk a little bit about business and kind of the stuff that you went through. So you, uh, where are you from? Uh, Los Angeles. I'm from the east side of Los Angeles, California. But you, you told me by age 26, you had 11 different businesses. Yes. You said around the, in your early or mid 20s, you were producing Broadway shows that you were like in the mix at a very early, early age. How, how did that kind of come to be? And, and what were those 11 businesses? Well, I used to be, I used to, uh, I used to own a limousine. First business I, I had was a limousine service uh, that was uh, quite profitable. And I also had a construction company. I had production companies. I had music companies. I had uh, uh, salons, like beauty salons. I had uh, uh, real estate investment companies. So I was just kind of like all over the place. And I, I also produced uh, not just concerts and plays, but also uh, I supported clubs in the city. How big was the, the the limo business? I had pre, I had uh, I had about 30, 30 cars, and so, but there was uh, luxury uh, limousines. They were uh, ultra scratches. At the time, it was pretty uh, pretty impressive. This, this style of car that we had. Yes. What type of monthly revenue can a limo business make? <laughs> Man, it. You know, it depends. I stay pretty booked. I, I spend a lot of time um, advertising. So a lot of times uh, I would have, beyond the cars that I possess, I would have uh, people calling me. And so a lot of the services that uh, surrounded me didn't have business. And so I would, form them, I would form out the rest of the business that I didn't have the capacity to serve. So a lot of times I would provide opportunities for the other uh, car services that didn't advertise as much as I did. So maybe somebody needed a hundred cars and only had 30, I could provide them with a hundred because I would parlay it out to uh, what they call form out to the other companies, which you get 50% of the uh, s service that is conducted. Like an affiliate providing. fee. Right, right, but you actually get half. <laughs> you get half of what it is because you're the one who uh, initiated the sale. What? So, how old were you? And how old were you when you had a limo company that had 30, 30 cars? I probably maybe twenty three years old. How on earth does that happen? What age did you start working? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, as a youngster, I started working. I used to work at, I mean, uh, likely places uh, to learn uh, business structure. Uh, when I was a kid, I mean, like I'm talking about like before I even went to junior high school, I worked at a shoe shine parlor. And, and, and at that shoe shine parlor, uh, it was in my neighborhood, but it was two shoe shine parlors. It was one on one end of the corner and one was on the other end of the corner. What I was able to learn from that experience as a 12, 13 year old kid 
an 11, 12, 13 year old kid is competition and how business was ran. And, and these two guys competed with each other, but they also hired, you know, kids from the neighborhood to work at these shoe shine parlors and we competed with each other. And so <clears throat> I learned a lot about business from that practice and that process, but I also learned I used to listen a lot. You know, a lot of people come in different from different walks of life. It could be preachers and business owners, uh, people from the street. And you would just, you know, while you're shining their shoes, you're listening at a young age and you're hearing different, uh, <clears throat> hearing about different opportunities and how people approach business differently. And so I was always like a sponge at a young age. But, you know, for instance, and I also learned how never to judge a book by its cover. Like sometimes a guy might pull up and, and be in a nice car, and, and you're, you're like, people is, you know, trying to get that customer. And this guy comes in, may may only have one or two pair of shoes, and may not even be a tipper. But then a guy pulls up in a station wagon or a regular car, and he might have 30 cars in there, you know, 30 shoes in there, and also is a big tipper. So it's just this learning how to read people and, you know, just that whole competitive thing that was amongst us as you youth to compete and, you know, be at our best, be dressed, you know, represent and, and you know, honing in on our skill. So I try to learn something from everything I always did as a kid. Like, how do I use this moving forward? And, you know, what is it? What's the lesson, you know, learned here? You know, so uh, that was that was and my mother also on the uh, a, a restaurant in the neighborhood and I watched how she navigated that and how she would, how she handled her customers and how she worked with her staff. And, you know, I actually remember before she bought that business, when she used to work for the people that she bought it from, how she, you know, raised up, rose up in that in, in terms of management and then acquired that business. And so just watching people uh, be effective in business at a young age had a profound effect on me. And you end up kind of getting in trouble, which I'll let you tell a story in your 20s. But before that, how how big was your empire in terms of employees at its peak? Mm, I probably had about 150 employees. And can you reveal like how much revenue like this whole, the, the whole empire was bringing in? Well, I was, I was making millions of dollars. I mean, you know, it's, 35, 36 years ago. <laughs> so I don't remember the exact. I mean, that I builds remember. up though. What do you, what did you do with your money? I always invested in, in real in, estate. In, in real estate? In, yeah. So you're not, not public equities. You liked real estate and you're, so you're buying real estate in your neighborhood? Yeah, real, yeah, all over. In, in, in where I could find a deal, uh, you know, to buy, you know, like a rehab properties as well as you no know, luxury properties and, uh, business uh outlets i would i would purchase it how many do you own how many how many buildings mm, probably 30 or 40 buildings damn you still own them <laughs> yeah i own what i own <laughs> it's been a long time brother it's been a i long mean that time. adds up that adds up i i just started purchasing some stuff um about three years ago and i'm like if i just do get one or two every single year i mean these definitely add up and you you bought it at a good time, I bet. Oh yeah, it was uh, it was you know I was in a position to buy buy a, buy a different type of properties that came into my preview. So, but the thing that you're most famous for is the entertainment stuff. When did you? What led you to entertainment? Was it the plays at first? No one of one of my first. Well, I said limousine was one of my first major business, but I had opened a. Um, I had opened up a, uh, a one in that building I was telling you about that was on 54th and Crenshaw. I opened up a studio, and we created a company. It was, I believe, it was called the Jingle Factory. And what I would do is make commercials for local uh, businesses, and so with the uh, local radio stations, and so uh, like KLJ, KLJLH, and uh, KACE, and, and and so that that brought me around musicians. So, you know, I would have people sing hooks and make certain melodies for it to go with, you know, certain businesses to give it a certain aesthetic. And so I, a lot of uh, <clears throat> uh, producers and singers would come into the studio and I kind of just kind of 
drifted off into that world. Uh, started managing groups and uh, working with uh, different record labels and production companies. And at the same time, as my limousine girl was growing, I worked with a lot of production companies as well and artists uh, would use my services. So just being in that circle connected me to uh, that world. And so for different reasons, I got involved in uh, the music business. Was there anyone that is uh, that I would know of that you started working with like really early around, on around that time? At the Was it called the Jingle Factory? Yeah, the Jingle Factory was most commercial. It, it was commercial based like that. You know, we did commercials in the city. So basically that you know, I did, did my own jingles for my own uh, limousine service as well. So, no, that was uh, non-celebrity. That was just commercial. But at the same time, I started working with, uh, you know, Motown. I started working with, at the time, Motown was uh, uh, pretty hot in the city. So I was working with Motown behind the scenes a lot. And then how did that kind of go into the production companies? Well, I, I created a production called Why Not Production. And I just felt like <laughs> during that time, um, it was hard for people that look like me to uh, to really uh, get a stronghold in the city. So I decided to create my own production company. So, and I would, you know, be available to help produce artists that didn't have the financial wealth at all to be able to do it themselves. And uh, somebody brought me a, a play opportunity, and I I never I never was involved in plays until that moment, and. I just thought it was just a, a real creative space uh, for people who were, you know, in the movie business but didn't have work at the time but could hone in on their craft and also provide entertainment in the community. And a lot of people may not have been used to uh, experiencing the plays, and so that gave me an opportunity to bring that kind of entertainment uh, to my community. So it was very exciting. I got to meet some some pretty, pretty heavy hitters. Uh, like I, met, I met Denzel uh, during that opportunity. I met uh, Paul Winfield. I met Vanessa Williams. I met uh, Richard Lawson. I met uh, uh, Ruby D. Uh, I mean, Al Freeman. I mean, I could just go down a list. Uh, there was a number of people who uh, worked with me on this uh, production. I worked with a guy named Woody King. He was out of New York. Uh, was the director, and Ron Milner was happened to be the uh, the author of this particular play called Checkmate, and I was able to take it to various cities and uh, ultimately got it to Broadway with the Nederlanders on Forty Six in Broadway, and my life came crashing down right before we actually launched on Broadway. We was on Broadway, but I didn't get to market and promote it the way I normally do. I like to market and promote the projects that I'm involved with. And so what does that mean? You you basically, they, you know, someone came to you and they go, hey man, I got this idea for this play. I got, here's my vision, yada, yada, yada. Here's what I think could be the outcome. And you're like, all right, cool. I'll put up a hundred K. I'm half owner and um, I'll help make connections. You're going to do a lot of the day-to-day -day work. I'll oversee and I'll make some connections. And Or were you more hands-on? Like, what's that look like? Okay, like, when you talk about, like, when I was telling you about all my investments was cons uh, consistent. Like, I would like to come into the, the management aspect of it. What that does, though, uh, helps me understand the business. Okay, I may have management skills, but I may not have... Uh, an, uh, an insight on that particular business. So part of that, that 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 relationship, that merging of that relationship, you need to teach me everything you know about what you do, and then I, you know, compile that with my management skills, and then we could, you know, move on to the next level. But that was part of what I would do. You know, I would come in and decide if this is something I want to invest in, and I would become the managing partner, but also I, I want to learn everything that everybody here knows so that I could be effective in that position. And so that's, that's usually the role I always took. What's it like working with, and, and by the way, at this point, you're still in your 20s. Yes. 
And you were working with some up and coming people, but you were definitely probably working with some established people. What did they think about this guy? They say this, I mean, you, you got this tough guy persona now. I bet you had that same persona back then. You know, you could be, in, you, you, you can be intimidating, <laughs> I, I imagine. About, they're, they're like, I don't know about those tough guy. What, well, what I, 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 I'm saying that's my opinion. Yeah. If I had to do business with you, I'd be like, man, I don't want to make this guy mad. And so if you're in your 20s and you're like, well, ooh, this young black guy from, uh, he's talking about living in L.A. Now he's wanting to be out here in New York putting on these plays. Like, who, is, who does this guy think he is? Like, where, where, uh, where did you deal well, with you a know, bunch of I'll, that? Like, I always respect other people's territory, you know, no matter what business you're in. And, when I, and I always deal with people respectfully, you know. I mean, there may be, it's the persona and the perception of me, and then it's the reality of me. And so the reality is that <clears throat> I always was straight up, you know, so... It, you, there may be that tension, there may be that consideration before they get to know me, but then once they get to know me, oh, this guy's, you know, he's up, he's on straight up, 100, you know, just keep it real. You know, <laughs> so, you know it wasn't, uh, you know, I just think that, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, probably later on when the death row stuff happened, I just think people conflate everybody's attitude as one. And, you know, we all were different. You know, we all came from different uh, vantage points uh, to help create that. And I just think that sometimes people don't pull back and say, you know, who are the individuals that was a part of that uh, entity? And um, that's, a, that's a different, that that will bring about a different perception once people got to know who you are. You know, I come from a pretty tough neighborhood. I, I don't, I won't argue that. I, mean, I think that you have to be pretty strong to, to survive it. Uh, and especially with certain businesses that I was in as a youth, you had to be pretty strong to survive it. And a lot of things I did at my younger youth, I'm not really proud of, especially now today after being away for 33 years and, and you know, going through that experience and reflecting back on on the, my quick rise and heavy fall, you know. But at the same time, I always try to stay positive and, and try to see what that journey had to offer. So you said um, the plays, um, the play didn't work out because your life came crashing down. What's that mean? Right, when we went through the, the pre-Broadway and got ready, you know, open full full scale, I was arrested and uh, sent to prison. Uh, what were the charges? I was uh, I was arrested for one for attempted murder and uh, two uh, later for drug uh, conspiracy. And the, the uh, later the uh, drug the uh, attempted murder was I was exonerated at the end after thirty after twenty three years. But, you know, I knew I was innocent, and I think that made me take it, you know, lightly. And I didn't really, I kept working while I was out on bail, not thinking that this would, uh, the results that happened would happen. I thought I was, uh, you know, I would be vindicated, and life was upside down. What, were, were you decades. guilty of the drug charges? Yeah, I used to be involved in drugs. I, and, um. Uh, so I was also, uh, even though I had got out of the drug business, you know, you get pulled back in based on some previous uh, phone calls. I had got out, but still, you know, that's they call that karma, you know. You have to pay the piper. And when I, when you Google your name, one of the first thing comes up, it's this interview you did, you did, I forget the publication, but the article said at one point, you're doing something. I think it said close to a million dollars a day in drug sales. Is that yeah. true? I think it said two. <laughs> Was it two million a day? Yeah, I think it said two. I'm not proud of that. So, what, what's the story of that? It was hard work. I mean, you know, I mean, the thing is, uh, even and that's though, coke, I guess. Yes, it was cocaine. Yeah, and I think that, uh, like I was saying before, uh, whatever I put myself to. Uh, Good, bad, or indifferent. It was. It was like I put myself to it, you know. And then it was like only after watching the uh, repercussions 
throughout my community and communities across the country that I realized that you know what was making me uh, rich was also making me poor in spirit and in uh, culture. You know, I was helping to destroy my own community, and so you know, so I don't really take a lot of joy in talking about the amount of money I made in that business, even though I was engaged and I was I was pretty uh, focused in that business when I was young and misguided in that business venture. But uh, I had a lot of time to reflect. And I bet that's confusing because whenever, you know, I start something and it starts working out, working out, I get, it's like a dopamine rush, you know, just seeing the sales come in. I mean, it's exciting, you know, like it's fun. Um, in your case, it's even though people were getting hurt, it's definitely exhilarating and it is exciting. And even if you're using the money to invest in cool stuff that helps your community, it's still, and it hurts people, it's still exciting. I mean, I bet that's still an exhilarating, adventurous well, life. And, and you gotta understand some at, at a young age, you know, just, you gotta, you gotta, see, it's gotta put everything in its proper context. You know, like I'm growing up, people selling weed, you know, it's no, it's no harm, you know, it's like, and then this thing is introduced to the community and, and it's just the next level from selling marijuana or whatever it is. And you, next thing you know, you're involved and all you see is the dollars you know, what you're making, the transactions, you know, because really, everybody was, you know, you smoke weed, next day you get up, you go to work, you do what you do. You don't really know, you had no previous uh, insight on what this could, could become. And so it's just like, okay, this person is buying it, you're selling it, it's in your community, it's available, that's it. That's all you see. And then when you see later on, when you see that this is not like marijuana, this is something else, and it's changing the, the uh, it's just changing the whole makeup of the community. You know, people are just not themselves no more. And now it's like, whoa, you know, especially if you're a conscious person and you was raised in a good, you know, family setting, and now you're out here hustling, and you hustling in a way that other people that have become vulnerable to this particular drug, which I never used, so I didn't know, I didn't know what it felt like, but that, you know, there's people that I cared about later, I would see them fall victim to it. And, uh, you know, that's that karma I'm talking about, it comes back to you, you know, it's like, wow, well, this is what I'm doing. And, and so, yeah, I made a lot of money, it was exciting, it was adventurous, it was, it was uh, enterprising. But then it also had that side that you you can't ignore. And then you got what was your sentence? Thirty three years, and that was mostly the attempted murder or the no. The, uh... That's that's that was not my sentence. I had a twenty five life, and on top of that, I had a twenty year sentence for the federal uh, with the feds. Damn, what's that feel like hearing that? It's unbelievable, <laughs> but it, but it's real. <laughs> I mean, like the the, uh, the the criminal system is real. I mean, it's it's like a lot of people. I think conversations like the one we have it should be had more. I think people just see the glitz and glamour of a particular lifestyle, and and the fact that a lot of us have very little patience because some of us live in conditions that are unbearable. And so you just want to get out, however you got to get out. And so you don't realize that the patience that that you need, that you can exercise, that you should exercise, could save you a lifetime of misery. And so, it's, you know, in hindsight, you can see, you know, like in reverse, you know, so I, I believe I should be a conduit for that. I believe I should be able to talk to people that are, are poised to make some of the same uh, useful mistakes that I made, thinking that it's going to solve the problem when it creates multiple problems uh, and it affects your family and the community in ways that you can't even imagine. When you were, so you started death row, or and I want to hear about that, while in prison, after you went in? Yes. How on earth does that work? 
Well, you know, I'm I'm enterprising. <laughs> what do you want me to tell you? I mean, what do you want me to say? What do you want well, me to say? what's it? What, I mean, when you're just sitting there, you have a visitor, or you're writing letters, you're doing phone calls, and and someone comes to you and be like, "Hey, man, you want to start a record label?" I mean, I don't even know. I mean, how long were you in in there before you you kind of got this idea, or or, or how'd that happen? Well, like I told you, I was involved in different aspects of the entertainment business already. So it's kind of like I was already bitten by the bug. Uh, what happened was, uh, uh, I don't know if I should tell you this part of maybe you should wait till the movie come out. But uh, maybe, you know, maybe maybe you don't already heard some aspects of this. But it's just, uh, you know, I was, uh, I, I just still had all this energy inside of me that I wanted to do something. I didn't want. I didn't want my sentence uh, to be the end of me, and you know, I just I just couldn't stop. You know, I'm a kind of guy that only slept three hours a day, and uh, and, and like I said, ran eleven businesses. How do you go to prison and sit there and then be okay with that? You know, it's just not what it is. So you always you're trying to find something outside of your environment that allows you to stay alive. Uh, in spite of your circumstances, in spite of your sentence that has been imposed, you just, you know, you're still youthful and you still you still want to have an impact because, like I say, when you deal with the totality of a person and you see that there was more good than bad in that person, that's that's what you're trying to get back to, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like sometimes I can say, just trying to find a cool place in hell, you know, for all the bad things that I did, you know, praying that God could, you know, forgive me for that. And at the same time, being able to give something back to my community that they can use uh, instead of something they shouldn't use. So what's that creation story look like? Um, who, uh, who contact, I mean, I, I don't, I, I told you I read, uh, which book? Uh, Ruthless is it? Is that what the book's called? Ruthless is that by Jerry Heller? So I, yeah, I Ruth, have that. Yeah, so Ruthless was before Death Row, right? So, right, 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 right. So Death Row is the, if you say, if you will, the next iteration of Ruthless, uh, because one of the main components of Ruthless was Dr. Dre, and Dr. Dre uh, was the producer of the music that the that mostly was produced by N.W.A. Mostly all the music that was released at NWA was produced by Dr. Dre. And so NWA was a group and Dr. Dre was a part of that, but he also was the engine that made it run. But I don't think that Easy e rest in peace, and Jerry Heller, also deceased, understood what, understood Dre's value it, to the point where it shouldn't have been uh, overlooked. And so that opened up an opportunity for him to be disgruntled and uh for sure Knight, uh who uh who actually be began to manage Dr. Dre after managing an artist by the name of DOC, uh who introduced Should to Dr. Dre. And uh then I was introduced to Should shortly after. And uh that's how that relationship came. He was managing Dr. Dre and DOC. And uh, we created a company. First, we created Godfather Entertainment, and then out of that birthed a uh, Death Row. And so, then it was, who came up with that name? I came up with Godfather Entertainment, and and based on my situation, you know, I was actually housed on Death Row. I was, In San Quentin. I, yeah, in San Quentin. For I wasn't sentenced to death row. I was housed there for a short period of time, and I was able to witness young people, younger than myself at the time, being sentenced to death row. And I just, you know, I, I was profoundly affected by that. And I thought that, uh, you know, so you hear different versions of the name because there used to be death, death like D E F row, and then we decided to call it death row, which I, that's the company I set up. Defro Records, and, and you had uh, um, you David guys. Kenner, I, mean, I, I worked with a, uh, my attorney at the time that was working with me on my appeal. David Kenner was also part of that partnership that helped assemble that company for me while I was behind bars. And you guys, I mean, you didn't necessarily, you didn't even shape the genre. You created it a little bit. You know, you had uh, Pac, 
Snoop. Who else was on there? I mean, it's it's the people don't realize Death Row didn't have a Lawrence Roscoe, it just had an effective one. Uh, and also my ex-wife, Lydia, she was also a part of the management team that helped facilitate the company in the beginning. Uh, so to answer your question, it, it's like the moment the world heard Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre's voice together, it was, it was a game changer. You know, it was, uh, you know, a Warren G uh, was a part of a group with Snoop 213 and his relationship with Dr. Dre facilitated Snoop Dogg coming into the fold and uh, DOC working with uh, Snoop and helping him you know, up his game in the rap game and Dr. Dre looking to create another star and that relationship uh, forged together just it just made magic, but there was other members, other producers, and other artists that was on the label. Female like Rage and Jewel, the Dog Pound. Uh, there was a, there was a, there was just a lot of synergy there, you know. And they all come from different walks of life, and and it just it was that time, you know. Some things was just time, you know. The energy pot came later, but uh, he. Uh, brought some of that fire with him too. And it just put death row in history books like no other label because a lot of people don't really understand that death row was the the little choo-choo train that would, you know, it just it connected dots to so many different companies that a lot of people don't even realize that. Like what? Not, I mean, from Universal to increasing their distribution because of his relationship with death row and Interscope and one of brothers almost getting out of the music business because uh, the way they mishandled their relationship with Death Row and Interscope. I'm just saying it's it's so many different uh, aspects to Death Row's existence that most people don't even ponder. They're too busy with the negative side of in the drama that some of the people that was involved participated in, but they don't think about the enterprising nature of that organization which is what my focus is, is like, what it, what was his original intent and what did it do in the in the business world that most people don't talk about? It's, the uh, narrative has been focused, narrow, it's been, been, been moved to a narrow focus and hopefully I'll be able to expand that. Uh, you know, me and Snoop Dogg are working together. Snoop Dogg reacquired uh, Death Row and we're partners and I'm the CEO of the new Death Row that I helped create 30 some years ago. So it's exciting to see how that turned out. What's crazy is you've been around all these people and you actually saw them when they were young. You talked about all these interesting people, Denzel, Dre, Snoop. What, uh, what do some of these young guys have in common you think that kind of because they're not just like successful business people, they're culture changing people. They changed America, they they changed the world. What 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 attributes did they have in common? You know what I'm saying? Well, well let's just back up like like seeing Denzel as the young Denzel and seeing him now, he's still is consistent in his character. You know, his certain roles he won't play is is and it's the way that he approaches the craft that attracted me to that project checkmate in the first place. He was he was just always a consummate uh, professional. You know, it's just he didn't really hang out. You know, he just did what he did and he took off. But I just watched him and I watched his work ethic and I, and, and his projection in the films that he do uh, for people that look like myself. We're proud. You know, he makes you proud. He makes you proud, and, and there's not enough of that in our culture to have people who can represent. You know, just in this craft, you know, just a strong, focused, uh, intriguing individual, you know, instead of, like you used the word intimidating, like towards me earlier, you know, it's like sometimes that could be off-putting for people uh, and it and it kills opportunities because people see the book. Remember earlier I talked about judging a book by its cover. And uh, not really taking the time, you know, to connect to that individual. 
But Denzel has been really great with that, with the roles that he's played. So it's my honor and pleasure that they had known him then and to know him now, that he's a, he's a consummate professional even today. He uh, he's always you know thinking about his thoughts when he when he when he does a, a particular project. And NWA and Death Row is different now. It 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 had this. Uh, and by the way, when I said intimidating, in part I meant. I'm part. I'm intimidated because you've got this cool demeanor. I asked you earlier. I said, if you ever say something that you don't want on the pod, just let me know. And you said, I don't say things I don't mean to say. Like you're just. <laughs> you got this Clint Eastwood. Just like I'm. Like I just. You've got this coolness about you that is uh, is intimidating. Is what I meant. And I'm intimidated by your success. Well, I appreciate the clarification. Yeah, because, you know, I'm glad you said that. No, and I appreciate that aspect of it. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I just, you know, I, I just think about my thoughts. And so that's why I, I don't worry. I, and, I, and I appreciate you, you you saying that to me uh, early on, but I'm, I'm usually conscious. And if I say it, I meant to say it. You know, that's what I, I mean. You're very intentional. And, I, and that can be intimidating to people. Because when I get nervous, when there, or if there's silence or I'm nervous, I'll say yeah. shit that I don't even mean to say. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you don't, you, you don't seem to have that attribute. Uh, well, I've been in some pretty sticky situations, and you got to say what you mean <laughs> and mean what you say. It could, it could turn out real ugly, you know, if you, you, know, if you uh, don't understand your surroundings. And, uh, you know, you got to speak to your audience, you know, whatever that audience may be in, in real life. I mean, in life, you know, every day or just... In this type of setting, you know, like you never know who could uh, benefit from our conversation today or, or hesitate on something they're about to do and say, hey, you know what? That's some wisdom there. Let me let me connect to that. Uh, here's a person that done been through it and, and experienced it on different levels. And uh, he might have something to say, you know, so thinking about I'm thinking about setting up me a podcast, you know, so. You talking about your success? I'm trying. I'm gonna be in your rearview mirror for a second. Then I'm gonna be. I have a feeling you're gonna <laughs> only be in the rearview mirror for a second. Uh, but what yeah. were you saying about? I think you said NWA. I forget who you said. You're right. talking about okay. some of the artists. They were they were different in in a way that they provided an opportunity uh, for us to speak. Now some people don't like what we said, but it was different. You know, it was like you had a certain box that you know black americans and and not just black american hispanics and you know different nationalities that are sometimes regulated to a, a you know a box and so you don't really get to hear them but through this mechanism called music called hip-hop called rap called uh some people call it a gangster rap you know, i just call it reality rap you know whatever that reality was in us community being able to speak to it you know what i'm saying like becoming your own cnn or, or fox news you know you can say this is what's happening good bad or indifference but this is what's happening in our community and they were able to communicate that and so my intentions was to elevate but at the same time this thing takes on a life of its own. And so, and then you get involved uh, in, um, then it becomes a business. And then you have executives and producers who start to see your world even different from how you see it. So later it was altered, but in the, in the beginning it was fresh and raw and uncut, you know. So you, people were getting mirroring in to a community that they knew little about. And so, that in that aspect, the the uh, rappers, uh, the the music business was able to op shed, shed a light on those communities in a way that it hasn't been shed. It. And especially when it came to po police brutality and you know a lot of the uh, injustice that was taking place in those communities, it just it just became a profitable vehicle that allowed us to talk about things in code or in you know to lyrics that normally you wouldn't even have access at uh, doing. So, What's was, the first song that you heard that you thought, oh, Death Row, it, this, I'm onto something? Well, it, 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 it's, it's like I got to hear a lot of it before it came out. So it wasn't, I mean, I, I got to hear the whole album, The Chronic, before it came out. And so, but 
the first when I heard the first song that was done on Deep Cover soundtrack, the single that Snoop and Dre did, uh, and I was in prison, and a lot of guys was ah, they they wasn't really paying attention to them. Really, to that happened, yeah, because it was NWA and other groups that was out at the time, and so uh, uh, MC8, all these guys that were out, you know, and then we had other local uh, artists, uh, Toddy T and Miss Max of Spade and Ice T and all these different guys were, you know, doing their solo career as well. But once they heard that song on the radio, One Eight Seven on the Undercover Cop. And they heard that melodic sound come from Snoop and those uh, thump, thumping beats from Dre. It was game over. <laughs> it was game over, you know. And that was like, wow, you know, because uh, you know, I had tried to let them listen to it before that, and they they didn't want to hear it. Then once they and I got a line around the corner, they want to hear the tape now. <laughs> and then it's been like that ever since, you know. And I watched, uh, I was able to, you know, watch Dre and, and Snoop and them perform at the uh, Super Bowl, and uh, I was able to you know, attend their practices, and it was just watching them at work and flashing back to what happened so many years ago. And just to see them become top notch in their game, because we took it from an independent uh, type of setting with Rufus and uh, NWA, and Death Row was able to submerge itself into the majors and and become a major player, which changed the game for a lot of rappers that are quite successful today. So they were. Was it was it mostly on tapes or CD? It was tapes still when it when it first started. Yes, yeah, tapes. They did. It went to CDs. Yeah. Start How much out. was a cassette back then? So the, the, the Chronic came out in '92. What what year right. did you go away? I went away in '88. Okay, so you're in there for four years. Um, by the time the Chronic comes out, how much is a cassette back then? You think CDs in the late '90s were like eighteen dollars? What's it? You 18, don't remember? Eighteen to twenty three dollars. Yeah. So that so so you talking about nine dollars for a cassette. Something like so that. And then the listen CDs. to this. Yes, I didn't. I didn't realize how fast this happened. So I just I'm looking at the discuss. I'm looking at um, um, Death Row's uh, work. So the first album was the Chronic, right? That sold like three million pretty quickly. Then it was Doggy Style with with Snoop. That sold right. close to seven million, like pretty fast. Yes. Then it's All Eyes on Me by Pac, Tupac, and then another Tupac one. I mean. I didn't realize, I didn't realize how fast you came out the gate. Yeah, it changed the game. I mean, just all of a sudden, uh, it made people go crazy too. <laughs> so you know, like money just make you a bigger wherever you are. So you know, it's like a lot of, a lot of things changed. You know. So you're you're on te- on a ten dollar cassette tape. How much does Death Row get? Like thirty or forty percent? Three or four dollars on ten dollars? Yeah, that's about that's about right, man. <laughs> It's not bad. Damn, man. So, uh, I mean, what's it feel like to be in prison and seeing all that money come in and you're not able to enjoy well, it? It would have been better if I was on the streets, i tell you that. But at the same time, uh, it was good to see uh, legal activity taking place to make that kind of money. Uh, I come from a world where some people, not that you had to, but we felt that we had to do what we had to do to get what we had to get. And to be able to see a legitimate venture do so well and and those opportunities become available to me and so many other people uh that's what i kind of locked into like we we can go legit you know and and basically figuring out creative ways uh they they figured out creative ways to tell stories that uh that could capture the masses and uh, I just thought that was such a creative. Even now, when I when I'm around Snoop, or uh, and I see him do things so effortlessly, like he just, it's just like it's nothing to him. You know, it's like all these years he could still remember lyrics that he did thirty years ago, like he just composed it seconds ago. And uh, even being around Dr. Dre and being in his home studio and watching him and his team uh, 
could, you know, conduct full orchestras. It's like, what happened here? You know, like, and they still are coming with music and they're still working with young people and they're still open. And it's like, it's no like, I hear no, I'm done. I hear none of that. It's just like every day. And just to be in those environments and and just, you know, being recognized by those individuals as somebody that had an integral part in what they did. Uh, and, and me and Stupas, more than most, uh, are pretty uh, connected when it comes to that. You guys took off right out the gate with Death Row, but it almost seemed like, unfortunately, you kind of went away as fast as you came. I mean, your work stayed forever, but the entity kind of went south after only like a handful of years or, you know, was... Uh, well, it's back to management again, you know. It's yeah, what, like, would you, what, what would you have done differently managing? And was Sugar, was Sugar a good manager? Well, I just say this about Sugar, you know. I think, I think Sugar was really creative. And, uh, and he was in the right place at the right time. And and he was able to connect the right people. And so in the beginning, Suge, to me, could have been one of our biggest entrepreneurs had he not uh, imploded. You know, he, he, I know him, you know what I mean? I used to sit with him and I used to talk with him. So I know the side of Suge that most people don't know. And And we considered ourselves brothers at one time. You know, it was a close bond. And to see him unravel and and to uh, pull away from these opportunities that was surrounding him, it's just a tragedy, you know, because I know a different should. And and so, uh, but, uh, yeah, it went away for a little while, but it's back. Right. It's back and it's strong and uh, people are looking at it different. And so I have nothing negative to say about anybody because I just think that's wasted energy. I just think we all did what we did. Uh, and sometimes uh, you know, I could be wrong about certain things. The next person could be wrong about certain things. It's just how, you know, it's, it's how you deal with the present, you know, and and how, and, and, and can death row be seen differently with the new generation? And so we're about to see. At, at my at my last com I started my last company when I was about 25 years old and we grew we had dozens of employees and the average age at one point was like 23 24 25 and I was the adult in the room I don't drink I don't party I don't do any drugs I'm completely sober but a lot of my people would and it was a creative business and whenever they would start drinking and stuff I would always have to put someone in charge and I'd be like hey I got to get out of here I don't want to be around this um, and like managing young people particularly in a party environment and particularly creatives, that's a challenge. You have to like give them the lanes to stay within and let them be free within those lanes. And from an outside perspective, you dealt with that times 10, you know, they weren't yeah. just drinking and, um, you know, making bad decisions at the bar. Some, you know, Snoop got, um, he was uh, in trouble for, um, there was some, some, some worse stuff that was happening and, and all those guys had issues. What's that like managing cr creative wild, wild guys? Well, you know, it's called putting out the fires, but you know, it, it, you spoke about Snoop, he was exonerated for that case too. So. Yeah. Know. And I'm not saying he did anything. I'm just saying th that's hard managing. I imagine it was challenging managing creative people who also had a wild side or sometimes would be uh, in a circle of, of getting in trouble, regardless if they did it or not. What? Well, well in that in that particular in music or any creative, uh, I just think that you have to take people where they are, you know. And so what happens is, if you take away if you take away something, it takes away something. And so we all get to elevate in life. And so who you were and what you came from and the condition that you, the way you were conditioned to see the world, all of that had something to do with the way the music was made. And so I'm not justifying behavior of any kind. I'm just saying that you start where you start. And if you look at what you're talking about, about some of the conduct that different individuals uh, participated in early on, and you look at them now, you know, these guys are, 
philanthropists. They 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 have charities. They have foundations. They have they 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 change. They help and motivate and mentor other people in their careers. So, yeah, yeah, Death Row was all of that, and that's what made it exciting. And that was the energy that it possessed. And but it grew, and some people learned, and some people didn't. And some people went up and some people went down. And it's just, it's, you know, you're talking about a Shakespeare in play. I mean, you, there is no other. You know, it's just, you know, a lot of people lost their lives and careers and, and a lot of people became quite wealthy as well. So it's just a combination of it all, you know. So this story is still being told. Do you think that that creating Death Row, is, is that the, the thing you're most proud of career-wise? Well, my career is not over, sir. <laughs> and so, I, so far, I, yeah, so, so far, I just think that it's the most impactful. Uh, good, bad, like I said, good, bad. It's yeah, I can go somewhere, and you know, people from all over the world recognize the brand, and uh, and and I and you'll be surprised. People from high up in different uh, parts of this society, classes of society, has told me that when they were in college or you know, whatever they were doing, that that music. <laughs> Dude, I listen to it all. I know every yeah. word to California love to <laughs> hit them up. I mean, I know all these words. I, I grew up in Missouri as a, you know, as a 12 year old white kid in Missouri. I don't relate. I mean, I don't experience what they experienced, but like there was a rebellious side of me where I go, I want right. to stick it to the man. I want to, and I, I like what I loved about Pac in particular, here's one of my heroes. I love that he accomplished so much. What, how old was, I think he died in September of what, 96. Yeah. Um, he, he, he was, he was 25. He was a young guy and he had, he had an artful side to him. You know, these old interviews when he's 18, 19, when he's talking about, uh, I think Jada Smith or, um, and talking about like, you see the love that he has for this woman. And he's being artful and he's talking about um, like Brenda had a baby. These songs are like real issues. Right. But then he also got, he got charged with rape and he also was, you know, the whole hit him up thing. And with, with all these other guys, he was fighting. And I, what I love about him is that he was a flawed character who was mostly good. And he redeemed himself, like he would screw up, and then he he was a he was a rich character, and I was drawn to that. I'm like, I got flaws, you know. I had substance abuse issues, and I overcame them, and I did all this stuff, and I was drawn by people who screwed up and overcame, and then maybe screwed up again and overcame, and had this rebellious, bold part of it, and that's why I was drawn to it, even though I can't relate anything to selling drugs or to. Well, I can't well, relate to any of that. Well, even some of those charges, like, you know, with Tupac, we're not here to defend or, or, or revisit the case, but we know that a lot of times you have to guard the people that surround you as, as much as you guard the food that you digest. And sometimes you could be a big, big name person and other people around you could do something that you get it because you're the, you're, you're the easy victim. You know, you're the one with the big paycheck or you're the one with the big name. And sometimes you, you suffer the consequences of the people that you allow in your circle. So it's important to always be conscious of that because uh, a lot of times, I mean, yeah, he was rebellious. He fought back. He fought against. He was raised. He was conditioned to do so. But at the same time, a lot of times things were put on him that, really didn't have nothing to do with it. But at a young age, too. At a, young age. At a, at a yeah. real young age, when you have the spotlight. I mean, he was famous since he was really young. And yeah. I, I and admire talented. that. He was famous. And talented. He was, talented. he was very talented. And like you said, we all flawed. And and so it's just, we're human beings. And, and when you go back and you look at the age, and if you look at somebody that's 25 years age and now, and you be like, wow, this kid accomplished this much, and he was able to have this type of mindset and, and was able to be able to translate that into the music. I mean, come on. I mean, this is just, and, and everybody that worked with him always tell me about it. He was a consummate uh, a professional, you know, Hey, you know, we got to push, we got to make this happen. And, uh, you know, he, you know, he was something else. You know? And he was prolific. He had all those crazy. albums at such a young age. He was prolific. So I, I identified with those characters, even though on paper, there wasn't a lot that I could relate to, but I, I identify with their, Maybe not identified, but I admired them. I was like, dude, guys at young ages changing cultures. And well, I, th I that's, think it was that's interesting. It, it, it's funny you saying that because uh, my thing is, I think it's I think it's infectious. 
I, I think the sound, the energy was infectious. So you didn't have to actually come from that particular culture to to really identify. It just it it met you where you was. It provided you with some energy that helped you do whatever you were trying to do. It was I think it's more about the energy that it possessed. You know, like uh, people, you know, who Gary Vee is, Gary Vaynerchuk. Right. He's, yeah. a, you know, people, I watch him sometimes to get amped when I'm having a bad day. Yeah. And then, but when I was younger, it was, I would listen to hit him up or something. It's like, right. you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it, it gave me, it gave right. me fuel to, to get back on track. And so right. I thought it, I mean, I, I just love that stuff. I also, that's why I like startups. I like people who are just nerds playing on the computer and they, sh they create Bitcoin or, you know what I'm saying? Like they create something right. that sticks it to the man. Right. And even though they're just, you know, in Silicon Valley in an office, whereas you guys were down there and and um, uh, writing music, it's like it's still kind of a rebellious energy of us versus the world that I I think is infectious. I, I think that's quite relatable. Uh, the uh, a lot of the uh, uh, internet tech uh, entrepreneurs, uh, that that whole you know creating something out of nothing, uh, I think it's relatable for. Uh, people in the hip hop business, you know, creating something that was was meant for a particular circle that went outside the circle and, and, and affected the world. And so same way with these young enterprising uh, uh, engineers who uh, create something that we all use, like the phones and the different apps. And, and now that whole world is merging and trying to find its place so it's quite interesting uh, to see how it all uh, folds out. You know, a lot of big companies have been displaced because of the internet and don't know how to find their place. And it allows for new merging uh, creative minds to uh, take its place. So I'm excited about what the future holds. I have a lot of takeaways from talking to you. It's just like, I think that a lot of entrepreneurs like myself, I'm real emotional. You know, like you're into the arts and building businesses is my art and people who are sometimes artistic. I go up and down. I get real sad. Sometimes I get real happy. You know, I'm not calm like you are all the time. I'm trying to work on my calmness just to be a little more steady. You know, you are you experience a lot harder stuff than I have. And you have remained you have this cool attitude. I said it's like Clint Eastwood. And so uh, I think you kind of inspired me to be calmer. Well, I think with me in particular, you know, I was in a situation where it was quite volatile and I had a conversation with God and I, and, um, I felt that I had reached an understanding. And, 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 I, and at one point I said, if I never go home from here and I never live another day, just the fact that I, I knew who the creator was and, and I was thankful for what God has done for us as to, and what we had to do to even be born. And so the miracle of our birth and how important that is to, to live up to that. And so you can't help but to be calm once you know that each person is, is considered a miracle. It's just for you to live up to it. And, so, that, and that's another thing. You got a good attitude. You got a really good attitude. It makes me, I, I get calm being around you and I feel more optimistic. <laughs> uh, and I also, uh, you know, I've always been fascinated by these people who are a little mysterious. There's a little more, there's always a little more behind that you don't even know. And they're always got something up their sleeve, some good story or some cool experience right. that they've had. And uh, I get that vibe from you and it inspires me a little bit. I think it's cool. I also think, um, you know, last night the Grammys were on and uh, I think it was, they had the, they did like the 50 years of hip hop and the ghetto right. boys were on singing one of their songs. Wow. And, um, they got the uh, they have this one line where they go, uh, real gangsters don't flex nuts because they know they got them. <laughs> and uh, that's uh, th that's kind of how I feel about you is uh, when you're when you're, you know, when you're like the guy, you don't got to say you're the guy. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. You are who you are. And, uh, and, and trust me, uh, when you're in situations like I've been in, you know, it's. It's, you know, you're gonna raise, you're gonna rise to the top, or you're gonna fall to the bottom. You know, it's just, you know, and it, it was weird being there and being away. And like I said, especially early on, it was really dangerous. But I come from a certain type of community, and I conducted myself a certain kind of way, and I was able to get through it without a scar. And then later on, to be able to be there when Chris 
and other people like Chris and his wife Beverly was able to create programs where people could really engage and and and, and recognize real change in themselves. Uh, so I've seen it go from you know where you can't even you don't know if you're gonna live the next day to hey man it's you gotta get prepared for the outside world. So you know so. And I'm glad uh, Chris introduced us. Uh, Last Mile is a very uh, progressive uh, program that teaches people how to code while they're in and also prepare them for job opportunities when they get out in the uh, tech world. So, Well, man, I appreciate you doing this. This is awesome. Where, uh, I, you have an Instagram. Is that, where pe- is that where you connect with people most? Well, yeah. The, uh, what is the official Harry O? Uh, did you see it? The official Harry O. I think that's what it was. It looked like it was you posting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I Michael tried. Harry O. Harris, the official Harry O on Instagram. I mean, you have 41,000 followers. It, here, it looks like a picture of you on a private jet or some type of Sprinter van. I don't know what you're doing, smoking a vape. No, you're I'm not something. smoking a vape. <laughs> it's a vape around me. But yeah, you know, that's the, that's the uh, official uh, uh, Instagram. But well, I'll, I, let you, I'll let you know when I set up the podcast. I could I talk to you know, all day. Yeah. I, uh, I like getting to know you better because I want to ask you all these stories, but I want to be respectful, you know, because uh, yeah. I look up to you so much. But there's so many stories that you have that, you know, you could talk for hours and hours and hours, I'm sure. Well, as long as it's an exchange, like I said, I'm going to be set up to be able to invite you on my show. And I want to ask you about some of the enterprising things that you've done. I'm going to be an open book for you to be able to ask me different questions that come up and, and different things that we're going to be involved in. A lot of things that we, we're we going to launch this year. I can't speak about it as yet in film projects as well, but next time we talk, some of it will be uh, came to fruition and we'll be able to talk about it. How about hey, that? and I got stories too. It's just every story you have divided by 10, and that might be as exciting as my stories, but... You're not going to feed me that. <laughs> I mean, I, I, actually, I'm getting into the podcast world because of what you do and, and, and people like yourself and the way you bring uh, insight to, to the business world. So I'm looking forward to being in that lane with you. All right? All right. I appreciate you, man. You're awesome. Thank I you. really look up to you. Thanks for doing Appreciate this. Appreciate you. Thank you for the opportunity.